Welcome, everybody. I'm Arthur Millick. I'm the executive director of the Claremont Institute's Center for the American Way of Life here in Washington, DC. Yeah, if you guys could move up, that'd be great. Um, it's nice to have you here. Uh, Harry Jaffa was one of the most important and influential academics of the past 50 years. To give you some perspective, Google tells me that there are about 135,000 professors, working professors, in America today. And unlike nearly all of them, Jaffa's works were read and will be read. Uh. It's true. Uh, unlike nearly all of them, his research, especially on Lincoln, was groundbreaking. And his contributions will be remembered and felt for generations. He founded his own school of thought, the Claremont Institute being his main institutional legacy which has spread Jaffa's thought to thousands of students over the years, many of whom have gone on, as some of you know, and some of you have lived out, uh, to have very prominent and influential careers. In fact, several generations of academics and political actors who I think shifted the course of the right in America were his intellectual descendants. He was a beloved teacher and mentor to many, a sworn enemy to some, and he produced some of the most penetrating and amusing political and philosophical debates in recent memory. For all of these reasons and more, his thought is worthy of many scholarly books, of which this, Glenn's book tonight, is the first one devoted exclusively to his thought. Uh, may Glenn Elmer's book be long read and followed. Glenn studied, as you guys probably know, with Jaffa for uh, about a decade in and out of the classroom, I should add. It didn't take that long. Um, long ago, Glenn was the director of research at the Claremont Institute. Uh, but that was before he took a 20-year vacation to work in government uh, in Washington, DC, uh, which included a stint writing speeches for uh, the Secretary of Energy. Please help me welcome Glenn Elmer to the stage. Thank you, Arthur. Uh, sorry about the mic problem. Uh, I don't think I can speak any louder than this without causing problems for the audio recording. So uh, move forward if there are any uh, seats uh, available and you can't hear. The United States is in the middle of a holy war. And it is my argument that Harry Jaffa has a great deal to say to explain that war uh, and to advise uh, the defenders of the American regime as to how to win it. Uh, today, by the way, is the anniversary of the Battle of Lepanto. I don't know how many of you are aware of that. A uh, great turning point uh, in which Europe uh, repelled the Turkish invasion in, what year was that, 1571. Um, it's an interesting day for anniversaries. It's also, t uh, today is also Jaffa's birthday. This, this date was not chosen at random. And it also happens to be the date of uh, one of the Lincoln-Douglas debates, the debate at Galesburg. Uh, so it's an interesting combination of, uh, of anniversaries. Uh, you may be aware that uh, the Claremont Institute, which Arthur uh, uh, mentioned uh, and which is hosting us tonight, uh, is at the center of a lot of controversy. It is being attacked uh, uh, in pages of the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, uh, the Bulwark. Uh, our panels at the American Political Science Association uh, were moved to virtual, which means that we were effectively canceled. Um, and the Claremont Institute is always getting into arguments with other people on the right, although I will argue uh, that those are actually subordinate to the larger war that I'm talking about. Uh, now, some of you may object to this description of uh, what's happening in the United States as a holy war, but I would contend it's being conducted along precisely religious uh, terms. Uh, we're debating in this country essentially theological questions. Uh, so you may not think we're in a holy war, but the left does. Uh, they may not believe in God in the traditional sense, but they do have very strong views on good and evil, on sin. Uh, they're not very big on redemption, but certainly there's a priesthood. Uh, and it touches on even more uh, basic questions uh, about human nature and indeed the nature of reality. Do our rights come from nature uh, such that government requires our consent? 
Or does government exist to pursue equal outcomes and racial justice by a class of self-appointed experts? Are human beings endowed with individual rights, or are we members of group identities, with some groups being more equal than others? Does mankind live under the laws of nature, or is nature something to be manipululated according to our whims? Is there, an is there an objective ground of morality, or do we create our own happiness through technology, consumerism, drugs, pornography? Do the good and the noble and the beautiful exist as enduring or permanent entities, or as nihilists on both left and right believe is truth an illusion and the world ultimately meaningless? These are the questions that animate the holy war in which the United States now finds itself. And again, uh, Jaffa's students, uh, the Claremont Institute seems to be at the center of these discussions. Um, clearly, it's important to focus on the practical matter at hand. But one of Jaffa's lessons, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit, uh, is that these, theater these theoretical questions are essential and indeed uh, 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 crucial to uh, the practical outcome. Uh, one of Jaffa's great lessons, uh, I think, is that uh, the, the fight cannot be effective unless we know what we are fighting for. Uh, Jaffa was fond of puns. Some were better than others. Uh, one of his better ones was, you can't beat a dogma with a stigma. And <laughs> what he meant by that is, it's not sufficient simply to attack the woke ideology. I'm speaking here on the assumption that most of us in this room are not what Tom Kleinstein, the chairman of the Claremont Board, calls the woke communists. Um, Jaffa's argument was you can't just attack the woke comms. Uh, you have to have something that you actually believe in, something that motivates uh, our side, so to speak. The left, of course, has a whole elaborate ideology uh, of systemic racism. Uh, it, it has a rhetoric to inspire its troops. It has a conception of justice above all. What do we have? Now, many people on the other side, of course, have a religious faith. But do we have a political, a non-sectarian vision of justice and of happiness that can rally our side? I think uh, this is something that Jaffa offers uh, that I discuss in the book that I think is uh, crucial. Tom West, a scholar at Hillsdale College, who is one of uh, uh, Jaffa's uh, more eminent students, uh, reviewed Jaffa's second Lincoln book, A New Birth of Freedom, which came out in 2000, by remarking that Jaffa agrees with Lincoln and Calhoun that, quote, political justice depends on getting the theory right. And it's this view that I think animates and distinguishes Jaffa's students and the Claremont Institute. Uh, Jaffa was a relentless critic of the conservative establishment because it was skittish about theory. It turned away from the fundamental questions. And it was his argument that that is precisely why conservatism was failing. And I think now, some decades uh, later, after he made this point, and after he's, Judge Alpha, by the way, passed away in 2015, uh, I think certainly the last five years have demonstrated even more that Jaffa was right about this. Uh, so that sets the stage uh, a little bit for Jaffa's relevance. Let me back up a little bit. Uh, and do things a little out of order, and now say a little bit about who he was and what his relationship was with the Claremont Institute. Uh, Jaffa was one of the first students of the great German emigre scholar Leo Strauss. Uh, some of you, would, I, I imagine, at least know the name. And Strauss, if not quite single-handedly, certainly uh, in very large measure, resurrected the serious study of uh, political philosophy, especially classical political philosophy, as the search for enduring wisdom, for eternal truth. And he was a, relent a relentless critic of a doctrine known as historicism, this idea that we are all bound within our cultures, that there are no permanent or enduring questions, let alone truths. Uh, and Jaffa, not alone, there were quite a lot of uh, Strauss's students who turned to America, but Jaffa probably more than anyone else, uh, turn political philosophy to understanding uh, America. He came to America, however, as Charles Kessler, one, another one of uh, Jaffa's students, says, in media race, uh, in the middle, uh, by becoming first 
uh, and throughout his whole life, a, a great student of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, there's a wonderful story about uh, Jaffa's uh, fascination with Lincoln. So um, Jaffa, as I said, was one of Strauss's first students. When, when Strauss came over uh, fleeing Nazi Germany, he stopped in England for a while, spent virtually all of his long and, and very influential career at the University of Chicago, but first spent a few years in New York at the New School for Social Research, and that is where Jaffa became his, one of his first PhD students. Uh, and uh, Jaffa had taken a couple courses from Strauss. I forget this was the second or third or fourth class. He took a course on Plato's Republic. And as I imagine many of you know, uh, this is Plato's classic dialogue on the nature of justice the centerpiece of which is this great dispute between Socrates and a character named Thrasymachus, a sophist, a rhetorician, who argues famously that justice is the interest of the stronger, which may be the strongest person, but also may be the strongest faction or element of society, which in democracies is the majority. Joff absorbs this uh, very uh, fascinating and, and subtle class that, that Strauss teaches. And then a few years later, uh, in downtown Manhattan, a few blocks from the new school, is browsing in a used bookstore and picks up a copy of the Lincoln-Douglas debates. Uh, doesn't quite have the cash to buy it, and so for several days comes back and stands in the aisle reading, like any of you who've been grad students know what it's like to not be able to afford, uh, afford a book you want. I, I've been there myself. But saves up the money and eventually uh, purchases this book because he's astounded, he's thunderstruck, reading this debate between Abraham Lincoln and Stephen Douglas uh, running for Senate in Illinois in 1858, uh, which is essentially a prefiguration of the, of the election two years later for president between the same two men, which turns essentially on the question of uh, slavery in a Republican form of government. And Strauss, uh, Strauss had taught Jaffa in a sort of an abstract way about this idea of permanent truths and the eternal questions. And Jaffa accepted that, but then reading this book, seeing these debates in 1858 about the nature of justice, Lincoln saying there is an objective permanent ground for right and wrong, and Stephen Douglas basically making the argument of Thrasymachus. Uh, Douglas's famous position was what he called popular sovereignty. Let the majority decide. If the majority wants slavery, there will be slavery. This is uh, in the territories, not in the states. And if the majority doesn't want slavery, then that's Thrasymachus. That's positivism. That's the, and, and Jaffa was astounded to discover this and develops then a lifelong fascination uh, with Lincoln. Uh, and then from there works, him, works his way back uh, to the founding and to understanding America more broadly. Now there's a long complicated story which I, I elaborate a bit in the book which I can't get into here. Uh, the, the very short version is that Jaffa had first seen Lincoln as a, as a kind of a savior or a messiah who had to rescue or elevate uh, the best elements of the regime. Uh, the Civil War is seen as a kind of a blood sacrifice to atone for the sin of slavery, and Lincoln is the, the redeeming Christ-like figure uh, uh, of that story. He comes, however, to take Lincoln himself more seriously. Lincoln had said that every political principle he had came from Thomas Jefferson, uh, Lincoln himself uh, described himself as devoted to the principles of the founders, and Jaffa comes to see that Lincoln, in fact, meant that, and comes to see that all the elements that he saw uh, about the high-mindedness, the nobility, uh, uh, the pursuit of human excellence are already there uh, in the principles, if not always the practices, of the founding itself. And this becomes a point of contention with some of the other students of Strauss, uh, some of you may know this term Claremont is called West Coast Straussianism because uh, Jaffa spent uh, virtually his whole career in Claremont outside of Los Angeles and some other camps of, of, of Straussians are called East Coast in different places. Boston College is a big sort of redoubt of, of uh, there's also now sub-factions, Michael Zuckert and others call themselves Midwest Straussians. Uh, I won't get into all of that. Uh, the, there are other elements of this dispute, in particular the influence of John Locke, and maybe this will come up in the questions, we can talk about that a little bit, and whether Locke was in fact at heart a proponent of Thomas Hobbes, who had a very cynical low view of human nature and of the possibility of politics, and there's a, a kind of what you might call original or perhaps orthodox version of Straussianism, which sees the founding as strictly modern, operating on this low horizon of modern politics 
that's founded by Thomas Hobbes and allegedly comes through Locke and dominates the thinking of the founders and thus the founding itself operates on this low plane. And Jaffa had believed in this at first and comes to reject it. Uh, and this is a cause of significant disputation even to this day among Straussians. Jaffa, however, um, comes to the view, as I said, of, of seeing a much nobler element. He comes to appreciate that the founders were serious when they talked about the importance of education and morality. He put great stock in the Declaration's affirmation of uh, the purposes of government as safety and happiness. He would point out this is straight out of Aristotle, right? Aristotle says the city comes into being for the sake of life, but continues for the sake of the good life. And safety and happiness is almost a perfect representation of this Aristotelian uh, alpha and omega of political life. Uh, he liked to talk about the manly vigilance uh, the founders believed in. Uh, there's a Greek word, thumos, which is usually translated spiritedness. And a friend of mine on Twitter just the other day was pointing out that uh, I think manly vigilance, I forget what Federalist numbers it, it's in, but um, this spiritedness is precisely what seems to be particularly under attack today. I don't know, you've probably all seen uh, this DOJ memo uh, that parents who get a little too uh, excited at school board meetings are going to be classified as potential terrorists. Uh, this demonstrates, by the way, that manly vigilance is not limited to men. Uh, it's usually women who get upset at these school board meetings uh, because uh, they're upset about their children's education. And so women can have manly vigilance too, and this is a good example of that. Um, what it comes down to is that Jaffa comes to see America not merely as uh, an emanation or an epiphenomena of modern theory, but as a practical achievement of statesmanship. The founders drew not only on Locke, but also other modern authors, uh, Montesquieu and, and Sidney, classical authors, uh, works in economics and military history and law. And the founding itself is not merely a work of theory, but a work of practical statesmanship. Okay. And I'll return to this point uh, at the end when I mention a few of uh, more practical lessons that Jaffa has to share with us. Um, before I get to, I'll, I'll probably mention three or four, but before I get to that, uh, it's useful to uh, explain what it is in a little bit more detail that distinguishes uh, Jaffa students and the Claremont School, uh, what makes them distinctive compared to other elements of the right today. Uh, I mentioned that they seem to be the focus of an unusual level of, of uh, vitriol, uh, and part of that has to do with Trump. Uh, Quite, quite a few uh, Claremont scholars. Oh, is it working now? I think so. Oh, all right. Uh, is that working? Yes. Oh, all right. All okay. Right. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I can save my voice a little bit. Uh, okay, so I'll push it up. Okay. Uh, how's that? Okay. Uh, so I'll, I'll project not quite so much now. Um, Part of the, the contentiousness uh, that seems to surround Claremont is, is the fact that a, a lot of Claremont scholars were, were Trump supporters. I don't think it's only that. I think it's also the fact that Claremont people and, and Jaffa students get into a lot of arguments with people, uh, especially and including on the right. Uh, this is, in fact, a very Jaffa-esque attitude. Jaffa was always getting into fights with people, especially on the right. His good friend, Bill Buckley, famously said, if you think it's hard arguing with Harry Jaffa, try agreeing with him. Uh, Hadliarchus, who some of you may know, who's another friend of, of Jaffa's, uh, put this another way and said, Harry, you don't know how to take yes for an answer. Uh, and what they meant by that is that it wasn't sufficient for Jaffa merely to have you agree with him or acquiesce or let him win the argument. He didn't want to just win the argument. He wanted you to understand the argument. He thought it was important to understand the proper meaning of equality. Uh, and he wanted you to get it just right. And it was usually hard for people to get it just right. And so he'd beat them up. <laughs> and he'd correct them over and over again until they got it right. Uh, so uh, in that vein, let me then discuss uh, some of his criticisms of the other factions of the right that um, are still going on today. We were just chatting earlier that a lot of the fights that are happening in the conservative world 
uh, not just Claremont, although to some degree that, uh, are, are recapitulations of, of arguments that Jaffa had in the pages of National Review and other magazines 30, 40, 50 years ago with some of the great eminent figures uh, of American political intellectual history. Um, let me start with the traditionalists. From the Claremont point of view, the traditionalists are probably the best allies in, in the fight against the woke comms. Uh, they are patriots. Uh, they take morality seriously. Their deficiency is that they have real trouble explaining why America is good. It's fine to love America because it's yours, and it's fine to love America because it's your tradition, but that's not really a sufficient answer. And it's especially insufficient now when the response is, well, we don't think America is good, and we reject your tradition as racist, and now that we're in power, we're going to implement our tradition. Uh, and in fact, parts of that opposing tradition, what Charles Kessler calls the second constitution, have in fact become our tradition in large measure. I mean, we probably have 100 years or so of pretty bad Supreme Court jurisprudence. So from the perspective of stare decisis, our traditions are not good. <laughs> Uh, certainly, progressives have controlled the academy, certainly higher education, also for about a century. Uh, and so that tradition is not healthy. And so when our traditions are no longer sound and healthy, traditionalism, from Jaffa's point of view, is not quite adequate. What's needed is some, again, permanent trans-historical standard. Uh, and this uh, points back again to the, the lessons that Jaffa learned from his teacher, Leo Strauss. There are, however, other Straussians who see this deficiency. Uh, I mentioned earlier the East Coast Straussians, and they are very uh, attuned to theory and to philosophy and to this question of natural right, which is a great theme in Straussian political philosophy. They tend to be, however, very unpolitical. From Jaffa's point of view, is they, are, they overemphasize the, dis the disjunction, which is very real, between the philosopher and the city. Uh, they see political philosophy as too removed from the concerns of the citizen, from Jaffa's point of view. Um, oddly enough, there's another faction of the right, uh, some Catholics. I just spoke at, at, at Notre Dame not long ago and encountered quite a few of these among the students there uh, who embrace some version of what's called the Benedict Option. That is, modern society, modern culture, the modern world is so corrupt Modern liberalism is so obviously deficient that the only thing we can do is withdraw from politics. And Jaffa emphatically believed that both the political philosopher and the citizen can't withdraw from politics. And from the point of view of theory, he thought political philosophy really only can operate properly by engaging with the opinions of the citizens. There's, I, I mentioned the William F. Buckley joke. There's another wonderful anecdote. Uh, a fellow named Martin Diamond, who was a prominent Straussian among the first generation of Straussians, also interested in America and wrote very good, from Jaffa's point of view, not quite right, essays on, on the Federalist Papers. Um, and he and Jaffa had a falling out later on. But Diamond taught in Claremont for a long time. And, and uh, he and Jaffa knew each other for a long time. And he used to joke, uh, if you want to study political philosophy the way Socrates did, uh, you know, Socrates engage with the opinions of the Athenians, right? He famously went out into the Agora, into the marketplace, and, and examined the opinions of the Athenians. And if you want to examine the opinions of the Athenians, go to some place like St. John's. But if you want to examine the opinions of the Americans, come to Claremont and study with Harry Jaffa. And Jaffa, always, uh, Jaffa and his students always appreciated that. Uh, from Jaffa's point of view, the point of Socratic political philosophy is not to be fixated on Athens until the end of time, but to engage with the opinions of your own regime. Uh, this is, a, from his point of view, uh, one of his key criticisms of some of the other Straussians. The neoconservatives uh, is another faction uh, who are, in a way, the flip side of the traditionalists. They see only the theoretical part of liberal democracy. Uh, and thus, they think that the theory of America can be exported abroad willy-nilly, regardless of culture and habits and, and religious traditions. And they miss the things that the paleoconservatives, the, the traditionalists, quite properly see, which is the importance of culture and habits and custom and history. And both of these are important. And Jaffa always emphasized the need to see both of these. Uh, another faction is the libertarians. Jaffa tend to dismiss that. Once he came to see his more sophisticated, nuanced understanding of the founders and the founders' concern with virtue and excellence, 
he tended to simply dismiss libertarians as forgetting that you can't have freedom without virtue. Uh, the last faction are the people that Joffre would call the Beltway Bandits, uh, a large part of Conservatism Inc., who are just sort of self-interested operators who say whatever is necessary in their fundraising letters, but don't really believe in anything. And since we're now in the belly of the beast, I thought I would mention that. Um, all of these factions, from, from Joffre's point of view and the point of view of his students, miss something essential. Uh, and so what makes them distinctive in their own self-understanding is having this broad conception informed by the great tradition of political philosophy that sees the conflict, the current crisis in America from the broadest perspective that encompasses theory and practice, ancient and modern. And thus, uh, the Claremont people tend to see themselves, uh, Claremont's often accused of having an inflated opinion of itself for right or wrong, but in their own self-understanding, it's because they do attempt to see uh, the, the, the crisis in the regime from this broad perspective, and thus see themselves as, in a way, the grand strategists or generals of the holy war, the religious war, the theological war. Uh, Jaffe himself kind of appointed himself the supreme allied commander of conservatism. Uh, he was constantly hectoring Bill Buckley about what was deficient in National Review and, and, and why wasn't he publishing more of Jaffe's uh, essays, which were explaining the right things to people. Jaffe did not lack for self-esteem. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you may be familiar with a, a story that uh, Winston Churchill once remarked about a colleague in the House of Commons, uh, a political opponent. He's a modest man with much to be modest about. Uh, and I would say that Jaffa was a vain man, and he was, but he had something to be vain about. Uh, and his vanity consisted in thinking that he had thought through some very essential questions, and if he was not the only one to understand them, he was among the very few to understand them and to have thought about them at the, with the depth that he did. Let me move on to the last section, and I'll be wrapping up in a few minutes, to just uh, recap and summarize a, a few practical lessons that I think Jaffa has to offer us. And again, I expand on these in the book. One is the centrality of equality in nature, both as permanent political concepts and especially for the understanding and appreciation of the American regime. And Jaffa saw them, if not as... Uh, exactly the same, certainly as coterminous or, or complementary, right? To understand equality properly is to understand human nature. And to understand human nature is to understand the proper meaning in which all human beings are equal. To the degree that we are all part of the same species, we are thereby equal. We are not gods or angels, and we are not beasts. And it's unjust to treat any class of human beings as beasts. And it's unjust to accept the unconsented rule of any class of people who denominate themselves as having the wisdom or the superiority of angels or gods. Humans are the in-between things, and that is the proper understanding of equality arising out of nature. It is, in a way, the flip side of what is now called equity, which you might say is not just a perversion, but the opposite of natural equality. It is, in a way, unnatural equality. In uh, social compact theory that animated the founders, there's, a, there's this concept of the state of nature. We are equal in the state of nature, by nature. We are born into a world we do not create, all equally as human beings. And civil society exists in order to allow us to perfect our natural talents, which leads to unequal outcomes. Madison and Lincoln and Joffa never tired of it, contradicting the error of egalitarianism. Political equality, natural equality, equality of opportunity is supposed to lead to unequal outcomes. Equity is the reverse of that. It denies our nature. It denies our natural differences. And in fact, it can't treat people equally because we're unequal in our talents. Men and women are equal, unequal, certainly. But to achieve equal outcomes, it has to dispense with equal rights. And so it's, in a way, the flip side of nature and equality. The second point I mentioned earlier about the dogma and the stigma is the need to have an affirmative understanding of justice and happiness. Over and over again, Jaffa criticized those on the right who refuse to talk about these high-minded ideas, who refuse to engage with morality because they thought it would open the door. Uh, well, they were skittish about it for various reasons. Uh, they thought any discussion of, of theory would open the door uh, to, to being shanghaied by, by liberalism. And, and Jaffa thought the conservatism could never succeed 
unless it gave a comprehensive understanding not just of American citizenship, but an account of justice, of the good life, and the good society. Uh, the third practical point I'll mention is the perennial threat of tyranny, and related to that, the limits of rhetoric. Um, Jaffa came to the study of America, of course, through the Civil War and understood very keenly from Lincoln the danger of majority tyranny, but there is always and equally the danger of minority tyranny, and Jaffa writes about this over and over again. And the danger of tyranny uh, points also to the limitations of reason, that any good political action cannot be conducted merely on the level of speech or of rhetoric, but must make use of political authority and political power. And thus, the Claremont Institute, its mission statement is the study of political philosophy and statesmanship. Statesmanship is more than speech. It is the use of, of, of uh, forming a political agenda, uh, uh, forming a political movement, of using political power and political authority. And this is another criticism he had of some of his other Straussians who tended to overemphasize the errors of the, the sophists, the rhetoricians in ancient Greece, who thought that politics could be reduced to speech or rhetoric. This is an interesting uh, lesson, by the way, from a lifelong professor whose only involvement in actual politics was as, as a speechwriter. <laughs> uh, not everyone knows that Joff actually wrote Goldwater's famous 1964 acceptance speech about extremism and the defense of liberty is no vice. Uh, he got out of speechwriting after that, after Goldwater <laughs> lost. Um, um, but, he didn't, but, but he appreciated uh, uh, the effect that that speech had in setting the stage for, for Ronald Reagan, as a lot of political analysts think. Let me conclude, then, just by returning to the present crisis and adding one more lesson. Um, both Joffe and Strauss were deeply impressed by Winston Churchill and his determination to fight even in the face of what seemed to be certain defeat, uh, perhaps uh, at the darkest moment in May of 1940, Churchill, nevertheless, as Jaff, I like to say, hurled defiance across the English Channel uh, and refused to succumb to what appeared to be uh, the imminent Nazi victory. Jaffa learned from Strauss, uh, as he liked to say, that despair was both a sin, that is a moral failing, and an intellectual error. And that is because human life is not determined. And so the positive lesson, and I'll conclude on this point, is that there is a weakness on the left that Jaffa always pointed out, and that is the possibility and the permanence of human freedom. The left is wrong to think that history is determined, and it is intellectually wrong to think that there is a linear progress and that it knows this progress and is on the right side of progress. Because this is an error, and because um, our side, for lack of a better word, understands this possibility of human freedom based in human nature, and understands human nature in a way that the left doesn't, this weakness can be exploited. Um, Jaffa was fond of a phrase, the metaphysical freedom of the human mind. Because man is free, he argued, success is always possible. But to succeed, we must be deserving of success. And for Jaffa, that meant having the courage to fight and the wisdom to know what we are fighting for. And that, I think, is the duty that Jaffa would call us to if we were alive today, to resurrect the possibility of Republican government in spite of the great danger we see, because nothing is ever determined. And I'll conclude with a line from the foreword to my book, which was inspired by my friend Chris Flannery. There is nothing more beautiful, worthwhile, or fulfilling that we could do. Thank you. <laughs>